Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Maggie. I'm glad you're all here. Um, we're going to talk a lot about your book today, Confidence Man, which you should go buy if you haven't already over at the tent, which is someplace over there. But I want to talk about first uh, something that happened here yesterday. Um, Liz Cheney spoke uh, to like, like 10,000 people. Um, <laughs> And I got a message from Washington, I think, because you told them about it, saying that she had said something newsworthy, yeah. something along the effects of, you know, uh, that people should not only vote against Trump. If I have this wrong, sorry. I think it's, you're paraphrasing, right? I yeah. Think. yeah. They should also vote for Democrats in the House. And, yeah. um, but I want to ask you a larger question about Liz Cheney and Republicans like her, but particularly Liz Cheney. Her, um, her transformation over the years has been startling from definitely one of the sort of leading figures on the right, conservatives, critical of Democratic presidents like Barack Obama, to this leader against Trump. And I don't want to in any way take away from her and obviously her trying to deal with this, what she perceives as this tragedy the country is going through. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you view what she's doing, but also in the context and the way it also raises her profile and gets her on TV and, you know, dare I say, sell books. Not that I'm saying that's why she does this, but. So first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you to Adam for doing this. Um, and I'm a super low talker, so if you can't hear me, um, please say so. But I can't yank this mic without yanking Adams away, I've discovered. You're so. more important, so yank away. <laughs> so, okay, so a couple of things. Um, I didn't get to hear what Liz Cheney said yesterday because I was on a conference call uh, for a story. I, I did hear about what she said, yes, and I told um, editors in DC. And, and so for Liz Cheney to say, as I understand what she said, which is just don't, you have to vote against Republicans in Congress, that's a, it's a sea change uh, for, for someone named Cheney to do. I do think that Liz Cheney genuinely believes in what she's doing. Um, I think that she was, you know, she was in the House on January 6, 2021, when a pro-Trump mob stormed the Capitol. Um, she did start raising concerns about uh, Trump already starting to raise questions about the validity of the election even before the election in 2020. Um, so all of those things are true. But I also think, and with, you know, I can't speak to motivations on, on books or not books and, and so forth. She certainly has a very high profile right now. Um, she's using it, as we've seen here, to talk about something that I do believe she cares about. But what I would say is it is complicating for a vast array of people, um, many of them Republicans, but also um, career government officials, career military officials, former people who worked at the Trump Organization, um, there's a lot of people who, who either supported Donald Trump at one point or worked for Donald Trump at one point or defend, and I, I left out lawyers, which is an important category. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of lawyers who worked for Donald Trump who now are vocally, it's, I mean, it's sort of shocking to watch, frankly, because I can't think of an, an analogous situation in history. Um, Ty Cobb, who's a, a lawyer some of you may have seen on cable news, he worked in the White House Counsel's Office during the Mueller inquiry, uh, the, the Russia investigation. And he's, he's a bitter critic of Donald Trump, and, and he's a fascinating person to talk to, but, I mean, with all due respect to everybody who I just mentioned, Donald Trump is the same person that he has been for many, many decades. Um, and he didn't become a new person in 2017. Um, to your point about Barack Obama, it's not just that he was criticizing Barack Obama, he was suggesting that Barack Obama was an illegitimate president, and, and it was in, in pretty starkly racial terms. Um, uh, you know, he took out a full-paged ad, um, and I know Ken Burns is around the festival, um, he did a documentary about this case, but an uh, infamous case in New York, um, uh, a, a woman who was raped and brutally assaulted in uh, Central Park, known as the Central Park Jogger, um, in the late 1980s, there were a handful of teen literal teenagers, 14 and 15 year olds, um, who were of color, um, who were arrested. Those convictions were later overturned. When they had simply been arrested, Donald Trump took out full page ads in New York City papers, including our own, um, saying, bring back the death penalty, bring back our police. This is not new, he is who he is, he is who he has always been, and so I understand that applying his behaviors in a situation like democracy and like the highest office in the land brings out a different perspective, but this is who he has always been and what I don't really hear is 
you do from some people, but a ton of reflection about why did you support him so vocally before? Why why did you, you know, is it is it because he was the leader of your party? Is it because you wanted to work in the White House? Is it because on and on and on? But there's so much attention focused on what the media does here and not a ton of introspection on that front. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, it's a good segue. Um, I, I wanna talk about what you learned writing Confidence Man that is helping you understand Trump today, both as a candidate, but also as a possible return visit to the White House. I mean, in the, also in the context of you said he hasn't really changed that much, so. It, so, I wouldn't say that I, I mean, I learned lots of new details, why don't I put it that way. I did, I did a ton of research on this book. Um, it was a very difficult process writing it, both because book writing is, I don't know if you know this, Adam, it's really hard. <laughs> Adam has a book. Um, and, uh, and it's about the New York Times, and you should all read it. It's terrific. But um, book writing is, is a very different muscle than what we do day to day. Um, but it's also, I was doing this book at the same time that uh, we were dealing with this transition like no other between Trump and Biden um, and the lead up to January 6th and then the aftermath of January 6th and these investigations. And, you know, the thing about the Trump story is it's it just sort of never ends. It goes on and on and on. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm doing a, a, an update to the book and it's been amazing how um, the act of reporting this book just feels like it sort of kept going. So I, I think the thing that became starkest to me doing Confidence Man was something that I write about, which is just that he is a man of few moves that he uses over and over oh. and over. And, um, you know, whether it's going into court and um, having Roy Cohn, who was his lawyer and fixer and teacher in many ways, um, accuse the government of, quote unquote, Gestapo tactics um, in, a, in a 1970s housing discrimination suit against, uh, against the Trumps, or whether it's threatening to personally smear someone um, with, you know, allegations of an affair or, or so, you know, that somebody hit on him or, um, you know, one incident that I wrote about <clears throat> involves, and he's talked about this publicly, um, probably wouldn't be so thrilled about me talking about it right now, but Neil, Neil Barsky, who created the Marshall Project, a former Wall Street Journal reporter, um, really, um, and, 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 uh, and a mensch of a guy, um, but, and, and a terrific journalist, he... Um, he wrote a, a series of stories about Trump's financial problems in the early 1990s, but he made one error, which is he accepted some free tickets from Trump to a fight uh, at, in Atlantic City. And the next time that Neil wrote something that Trump didn't like about his financial struggles, Neil made that public. Uh, Trump made that public, and it was it was problematic for Neil. Um, you know, you're seeing that, frankly, in Trump exploiting missteps in the cases against him right now, um, be it in Georgia or be it, you know, prosecutors in Manhattan where there, there's now a delay in what was supposed to be a trial starting on March 25th. And I know the legal cases are such a jumble that un unless there are lawyers in the audience, they're probably hard to keep track of. I know we all struggle to keep track of them. Um, but all of this to say is that he just has this, he has this set of tools that he uses repeatedly and seeing, as I did the book, how this plays out over and over, was um, was jarring. So that leads me to another question, which is, if he returns to the White House, if he gets reelected, will he be different in, to the extent that he will know the way the place works better? He will, the guard rails you write, I think you write about in the book, I do. You, you agree with the, word, with the word, people around him who just wouldn't do stuff he wanted, the loyalty that he demanded, would that be different? Would he be more empowered and more... Yeah, I'm not being judgmental here. More effective? No, I, I mean, I think in terms of, of, by effective, you mean, I think, achieving the goals he wants to achieve. Yes, and in that they, sense, right. I, yeah, when, whatever those are. I, I think the answer is is definitely yes. Um, you know, and, and one thing, and I write about this in the book, um, if you're looking at what a Trump 2025 presidency would look like, and our colleagues, Jonathan Swan and Charlie Savage and I have done a lot of work on this, um, but look back at, what Trump was preparing for in the final year, what turned out to be the final year of his term uh, before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And what he was putting in place was replacing certain aides with others who he thought would do his bidding, be it on trying to 
uncover the roots in his mind of the Russia investigation um, or, <clears throat> excuse me, changing civil service rules so that he could fire uh, appointees more easily and install people who would do what he wanted to do. Um, the, the big thing that doesn't really get talked about in 2020 is, and although we wrote about this in a piece on immigration, how the administration used the pandemic to essentially shut the southern border. Um, they used what was called Title 42, and it, it was kept in place actually for a while by President Biden. Um, but there were massive changes um, to, the, to the immigration system, and I think that you would just see all of that on a broader scale with, as you say, fewer appointees who are gonna try to keep him from getting to a yes on most of these things. Um, the one, there's, well, there's two caveats that I would put out there, and I don't mean this to say, and therefore, you know, everyone's concerns are not valid because that's not what I'm saying at all. I am saying that Donald Trump is, is a, has always been, and I write about this, this sort of mix of competing impulses, and one of those competing impulses is he's a credentialist who wants approval from elites. Now, I don't think he really cares about approval from elites that much these days. I think that we're kind of past that point. But I do think he cares about his press coverage and he cares about a, a, a perception that people don't want to work for him. So would that make him likelier to hire people who might not fit the MAGA mold or the strict Trump loyalty mode mold? Um, and that's an open question to me. Do you think we'll see as many leaks in a second Trump White House, should there be one as there was in the first? Because that was a real strong theme of what you wrote about in Confidence Man. It's a good question because I would say that his current his current campaign team has actually been the most effective that he's had. Yeah, I asked you about that, yeah. But there were, there's, the lawyers are where there has been a ton of drama. Um, and so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying that yes, there would still be people talking, A, just because that's how, that's, that's people's nature. Um, but one of the things that happens with Trump is people around him tend to, um, they tend to look for some kind of flat ground and they end up talking to reporters because of that, because working for him can be pretty disorienting. Are they trying to, were they trying to manipulate him or manipulate decisions in the White House by doing that, do you think? In some cases, in other cases, they were troubled by things they saw and were trying to put them out. Um, I want to follow up on something you said a second ago because it's been striking to me watching this from a distance and reading your coverage of it. It seems that the Trump campaign team this time around is much more, dare I say, professional, uh, really good at what they're doing. You know, he's improved somewhat as a candidate. You and I know that you can never judge one day what might happen the next. But am I right about that? And what does that say about, you're not going to predict the election, of course, but his prospects against President Biden and also, again, what kind of president he would be. It just seems like a different kind of world that he surrounded himself with. Uh, so I disagree with that on what okay. it means for his presidency. Um, because I think for a president, I think, I think Donald Trump is about a handful of things, and they are money and dominance and power and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and leverage. And so I think all of that is still who he is, and I think that that would be what you see. In terms of the campaign he's running, I agree with you that I think that this has been the most professionalized iteration we've seen. It's hard to emphasize how not professionalized the 2015, 2016 mm -hmm. campaign was. So it's like, you know, it's like, well, the bar is down here and stepped right over. Um, <laughs> I, and I think in terms of him being less visible, which is I think what you're talking about when you say he's a better candidate, I think when left to his own devices, he's not much of a better candidate. We okay. saw him do a CNBC phone interview the other day where he said like four things that had to be cleaned up. Um, the main one being that he left himself open to cutting entitlements and they had to, they had to pull that back. Um, because, and that's gonna end up in a Biden ad, I am almost certain at some point. Um, and when things are going well for him politically is when Donald Trump tends to um, make mistakes. So I think it's been easier for him to stay quiet because the legal cases have given him a reason to stay quiet. And the legal cases, all of these appearances that he's done in court have created their own sense of motion. Like they mm -hmm. feel like events, and, and he treats them like campaign events, and he sees them that way, as one aide said to me. They're not campaign events. Um, he also didn't have to go to these trials in January. These were civil cases, but he went. He wanted to go, and he actually said this. He said, I want to go to all my trials. Uh, now, his presence in, and this is where you know, the question of Donald Trump's behavior comes in again. I understand in theory 
why him being in court could have maybe helped him. It did not help him. Um, I, I went to the, the, the days that he was there, except for one, um, at the second E. Jean Carroll trial, which took place in January, and this was a defamation case. It's a woman, in case you don't know, who accused him of rape in the 1990s in a department store dressing room um, in Manhattan. Uh, he was found liable for sexual abuse and defamation last year in an, in an earlier trial that he didn't attend. And he really, I think, overlearned the lesson of, I didn't go to that case, therefore I should go to all of them. In this case, as the, as the, the plaintiff's lawyer, Roberta Kaplan, was arguing in front of the jury that Trump kept, according to her, defaming E. Jean Carroll, um, saying he doesn't think the rules apply to him or the laws apply to him, he gets up and he walks, he walks out of the courtroom. And the jury sees that, and they ultimately gave him an $83 million judgment. Right. So um, I, don't, I don't know that being there helped him particularly, if that's how you're going to behave. Um, and so all of that is, is just to say that, he, again, to go back to the theme that I said at the start, he, he, is just an, he is an unchanged person. If anything, he's kind of more of himself at this point. Do you, if I could distinguish a little bit <clears throat> about how much that helped him legally, $83 million says it didn't. Does it help him politically? Do you think that sort of, can I use the word antic, that sort of thing that he did helped him with his base and sort of building this idea that he's being persecuted by the government and all these cases are phony and... It, it's definitely true that he smears all of the cases with sort of the yep. same patina. Civil and... No question. Yep. Civil, criminal. I don't think most people differentiate unless they're following this stuff closely. Um, you know, he, he accu falsely accuses President Biden of orchestrating everything. Um, but... Yeah, for his base in the primary, there is no question that that has been very helpful to him. Right. Um, and it was galvanizing. And, you know, he used his first indictment, and again, that's a, a criminal case, but he used the first indictment, which was in, in Manhattan by the district attorney on March 30th of 2023, to force even his Republican rivals to defend him. And so that kind of set the tone. Um, I'm not clear that that helps him in a general election the same way. Right, I'm not sure that helps him with independent voters or, or women yeah, or, or women. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. and and I don't, you know, I I think that um, I think that if this Manhattan case goes ahead, which it, it is tentatively going to in April, it could get pash, uh, pushed back a bit more. That's going to be a real test of how do people react and do people think that that case is not particularly weighty, which is a criticism I hear of it a lot um, because it's it's that case relates to falsifying business records to pay hush money to a porn star during the 2016 election. It is it is actually an election interference case, um, but but the alleged election interference was Trump. And, I, you know, if, if I do, P, I've talked to Democratic pollsters who will say to me privately, if I put that before, this case before a focus group, most people are gonna roll their eyes or say rich people do this and so forth. And so we, we just don't know. I don't know what this is going to look like. If he is convicted in that case, if it goes ahead, it's still a felony conviction. So, Right. <clears throat> and polling, suge polling suggests that some voters would not vote for him if he was convicted. Correct. It's, it's just the yeah. question is, again, that case, he's been, he's been indicted four times. Mm -hmm. One of the cases is about mishandling classified material, and, and that's in Florida. One is a federal um, election subversion case, and that's mm -hmm. in Washington. And then there's this case in Georgia, which also relates to his efforts to subvert the transfer of power. Um, that case has been a little more damaged publicly. It doesn't legally less so, um, although three charges against him were, were uh, knocked out the other day. Um, people hearing this fact set may hear the Manhattan case and say, that's really not that big a deal compared yep. to you know, the, the, the heart of our democracy. Um, but we'll find out. You, um, you describe how immigration has been a fallback issue for him again and again, 2016, 2018 in the midterms, 2020 in his unsuccessful reelect, obviously now. Um, do you think this reflects any real beliefs on his part, considering his history as a business person in New York, and you write a lot about that in the book, or is it more testimony to, I mean, his gut level, instinctive understanding of the way politics in this country works? So... I, I think that his, I think he has a gut level of certain things politically. I think mm -hmm. he has a, he has a gut level that the abortion politics are not great for Republicans. Um, I think he has a gut level reaction to race politics. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is, is 
is the world he came from in New York. Immigration is actually an issue he was kind of late to. I mean, other than the fact that he's, you know, and we've seen it in his statements, he is unquestionably xenophobic. Um, when he was looking at running for president, and I write about this, in 2011, immigration was not something he was talking about. That was really put on his radar by Sam Nunberg and Roger Stone mm -hmm. after the 2014 uh, midterms, where immigration was a big issue on the right. Uh, and then he started talking about it, and they came up with the idea for him to talk about building a wall at the southern border. Oh, that's where it came from? Okay. Which was a way yeah. for him to remember to talk about it. Yeah. They thought if he had a visual cue, <laughs> which was a wall, it was a construction project, then he would remember to talk about it. And that then got converted as many, you know, initially sort of thin things do with him into a broader conceit and then something that he turned into actual policy. So no, I mean, it, it's definitely become hugely animating, but it's, there's this chicken and egg thing with him where it's like when you find out how something actually started, it's like, oh, um, it's, not, it's not that this was some long held belief. I mean, immigration is not, when he, he took out this full page ad, another full page ad in, the, in 1987, when he was promoting the art of the deal. And he was right. sort of pseudo running for president or interested in running for president at that point. Ironically, the same cycle in which Joe Biden first actually did run for president, the 1988 cycle. Um, but he was going up to New Hampshire and he was, there was a draft Trump movement. And in that, that op-ed did have contours of like the ultimate anti-trade case that he would make right. years later. And, and anti-interventionists, that other countries are ripping us off. And that can serve two purposes, whether it's defense or whether it's trade. Um, but he really didn't get into immigration in that. That that was he was almost a latecomer, right? Because there's no, as I can tell, there's no record of him really sort of addressing it as an issue. No, th this is HSA. not. No, there's there's a couple of issues where he has sort of, um, uh, you know, deep seated, uh, id like impulses. Right. Um, and trade is one. Right. Um, and foreign aid is one. Right. But and 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 immigration can be derivative from that, but that's not, that's not like a Trump original. And this is tricky territory. It's like what I was asking you about with Liz Cheney before. But to the extent that he believes anything, do you think he really believes this? Do you think that he believes that immigration is a threat to this country or is out of control? Or? I think I, I think he probably does now. I okay. don't know whether he ever believed it before, but okay. but I, I think he I think he often convinces himself of these things the more he says it. I mean, one of the things with him is he said he said this to me, and this is this is in the book. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you've all noticed um, repetition is a thing with him. Um, he And I, I described him this way in a piece not long ago, that he is the most um, disciplined, undisciplined person I have right. ever met, in the sense that, like, he just gets, like, a mantra and he repeats it over and over, witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt. Um, and these things do eventually sink into the public uh, fabric, the, the consciousness. Um, but part of that is he's then convincing himself as he's convincing you or trying to convince oh, you. Okay. So. Um, you read a lot about in the book about how angry he is and how even then he was motivated by grievance. Um, I assume we see no change in that. Not so much. much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how much will that try? I mean, he's, I think in his view, he would say, if he was here, he would say he has more things to have grievances about. That, is, he, that is, I'm sure, what he would say. Okay. I, I have to counter. I mean, <laughs> one of his one of his things is you know I'm counter punching and like it's always there's always there's always a reason why someone did whatever Trump is doing to them to themselves but um, he has always been this way yes it is much worse now I mean he began this campaign in March of 2023 March 4th 2023 he gives a speech at at the Conservative Political Action Conference mm -hmm. um, a, a committee conference in Maryland. And he says, I am your retribution, you right. know? And he goes, he says, in 2016, I said, I was your voice. And he goes through this whole litany. And, and now one more thing, I'm your retribution. And then 26 days later, he's indicted for the first time. And, um, and you know, when he delivered the line, it was almost like a sing song. Like you can, you can tell when he's reading off the script, it's like, oh. Um, and he was reading it from the prompter. But the reality is that payback is a recurring and running theme for him. And, I mentioned 2020, um, one of the things that happened at the very beginning of 2020, and that was also changed by COVID, was he was planning all this payback on the people who had brought impeachment against him. And, right. you know, that was that was a, a big a big expected move that year, and COVID took it all away um, from from all of the things he was he was looking toward. But um, 
No, that's who he's always been. I mean, I, it, it has always been, you know, somebody in the administration once said to me, described him as a guy who likes to fight. And that's definitely true. Um, and like looks for fights. Um, but he has a, he has a massive chip on his shoulder and always has. And then that just evolves into other things. What's the chip from, is it from his relationship? I don't get what he'd all psychological. Thank you, yes, no, it's good. <laughs> but I will. Fine. From his relationship, one really interesting part of the book is talking about him and his father, Fred. Yeah. Yeah. How much of it is because of that sort of dysfunctional? <laughs> it's definitely part of it. I mean, I, there is, um, you know, he, he, he had a father who was really tough on him and really right. undermining. and. Um, and who pitted him versus his brother. Um, and all of that then translated into sort of some, again, I, I, without playing shrink here, but um, it translates into a lack of acceptance and then that, that transfers to wanting acceptance from you know, folks in Manhattan. They, these were outer borough developers. Um, folks in Manhattan who he wanted to have taken, not being taken seriously is this running theme with him. Right. And I remember the first time that right. I really experienced it in a meaningful way was 2011 when he was looking at running for president and he started the birther lie. He didn't start, I should amend that. He didn't start the birther lie, but he threw accelerant on it and, and drove it to a, a central issue. Ironically, um, among the people at the time who were telling, uh, saying publicly this was a bad thing, Ann Coulter and Andrew Breitbart. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. it was so fringe at that point, what he was doing. Um, but he was getting very angry as he was talking about running for president, and people were rolling their eyes and not taking it seriously. And you know, another, another thing I write about in the book, I wrote about this for the paper in 2016 with our then colleague Alex Burns, um, <clears throat> that White House correspondence dinner that year when Obama smacked back at him um, and it was it was the night actually of the the bin Laden raid um, but Trump is sitting in the middle of this I, I was there that night it it was the room was very intense and Trump is sitting in the center at one of the I think it was the Washington Post tables and um, he did not look happy um, to put it mildly and that moment you know, they made a big show, people around him, of insisting. He loved it. They were all talking about him. Uh huh. He did not love it. And um, moments like that really stay with him. Being laughed at is a big thing with him. Didn't he kind of, Maggie and I both came from the tabloid world of yeah. New York City. Um, and as I recall, didn't he kind of invite it? He was sort of a, I don't want to use the word clown because that's way too strong, but he was this sort of big buffoonish figure in New York politics. I mean, tell me, I mean, you wrote a lot about this. Am I wrong? Am I being too harsh? And you're not being too harsh. What I would say is there's, or, or you're not wrong. Okay. Um, but I guess the way that I would put it is there are two ways to look at Donald Trump, and the tabloids leaned into one of those ways, which was as a clown. Right. And showman. And showman right, yeah. what, you know, the big what a showman thing with Trump is a, is a, a huge subtext um, throughout decades of coverage. Um, and he certainly does any number of cartoonish things, right? right? I mean, like he, the, the, the way that he and his then wife Ivana were right. constantly photographed and everything was gold gilded and so forth and so on. And he would have these fights with everybody all the time. And he would like attack Leona Helmsley. Um, Anonymous calls to Anon page six, Anonymous right? calls to page six. Yeah. Gossip um, page in New York. Right. Um, like, you know, so all of that's true. But the other way to look at Donald Trump, which I would actually argue is the real way, mm -hmm. is as a as a 60-year, 50-year student of power dynamics. And some of the coverage in New York did reflect that. It's just that when he became this kind of like... It, the tabloid thing really started after the divorce from Ivana that right. way because the, the, the divorce was such fodder and such a war between the New York Post and the New York Daily News, um, both of which I used to work for. Adam worked for the Daily News. Um, prior to that, Trump was really selling himself as, as a serious business player, which he was not, but that is how he presented himself. Um, and he was trying to make all these moves in the sports area. You know, he, 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 he tried getting involved in this alternate NFL league. Um, he, he had all kinds of moves like this. Wayne Barrett, who is a former colleague of both mine and Adams in New York, um, he passed away uh, the early 2017, right before Trump was sworn in. He did the first real deep dive on Trump and Trump's 
ga- di- the power dynamics involving Trump. And it was at the Village Voice, which was an alt weekly in New York, and the headline was, um, I think it was like father, like son, and it was sort of how Trump, you know, tries to tries to acquire and wield power. That's the way to understand Trump. And Trump takes advantage of the whole buffoon thing mm-hmm. um, because the expectations become lower for him that way. But at the same time, he resents it when coverage sort of focuses on it. Well, he has that. a weird, yeah. yeah I mean, no, it, I totally depa- it depends. So what, what, yeah. what, can I asterisk that, though, with one yeah. thing? Like, the things that would bother you and me don't bother him. Things that you and I wouldn't care about at all, he does care about. Okay. So I said, so I, I'll give you a for instance. Um, I'll give you two for instances. When the New York Post had a front page that um, that was supposedly quoting Marla Maples, sent his mistress, um, who then became his second wife, saying, calling him best sex I ever had. Okay, first of all, she never said it. So that's all other things. Never okay. said it. Um, and I. So it's not true. It's well, <laughs> thank you. Um, the, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the exit is over there. If you want, um, but uh, I. She never said it, but it, it was a very famous front page. He loved it. Like, it made him look strong and virile and da, da, da. Um, So that's the kind of coverage that most people would see and be like, ugh. And he was really happy about it. In, in early 2017, um, and this actually speaks to some of how he ha- handles pressure, too. Um, this was right when he was firing, either about to fire or had just fired James Comey. I was on Charlie Rose, and Charlie was asking me about Trump's, um, Trump, I think he was asking me about Trump reading, and I said he doesn't read that much, he watches a lot of television. And that's just a fact. And Trump saw it because he was flipping around on camera during Lou Dobbs, which was late at night, it was like 11. He was watching and TV. He was watching TV, <laughs> and he, he gets to Charlie Rose, and he, he, he stays, and he sees me say this, and he like starts, railing about this to AIDS and how terrible this was and like, you know, could you believe she said this? And then like complained to me about it and was like, I read and like, what? and I'm like, who cares? I mean, like this is like, it's also true that he objectively watches TV, but he sees that as a stand in for suggesting he's not smart. And so it's, I know it's weird, but this is sort of what you have to understand about it. Um. I want to talk, you, you mentioned before the stories that you've done with Jonathan Swan and Charlie Savage about Trump 2025 and, and next Trump term. Um, could you talk about that two ways? One is going back to what I asked before, how much this sort of retribution, mm-hmm. grievance uh, sentiment he has might in fact influence what he would do as president. But also second of all, policy-wise and personnel-wise, you guys have written in much detail about this. And I wonder mm-hmm. if you could share some of what we might expect should Trump be reelected in a first year or two on both those fronts. Yeah, I think it's really important. And uh, the three of us are really, really proud of this series. We started doing it in yeah, summer, great. early summer of, um, of uh, 2023. Uh, and we've, we've had a bunch of installments and then a bunch of other news outlets have, have done similar. And I'm glad they have because I think it's really important. Um, and I think it matters much more than, than horse bluntly, race. Yeah, than, than horse yeah. race and process in, in a, clearly pre-baked um, primary. Um, so for, for vengeance, look, he, he said after he was indicted that he was going to appoint a quote unquote real special prosecutor to go after Joe Biden and his family. Now I believe he said that after the federal indictment, um, the first federal indictment, which was on the documents case in June of last year. Um, and that was part of what got us launched on this series. That would erode decades of a post-Watergate norm of Justice Department independence. There's been a movement on the right to, to push for so-called unitary executive theory in which you know, the, the executive actually does control all of these agencies. So so-called independence, for whatever reason they were carved out, you know, will no longer exist. They'll be brought under tighter, con- tighter control. So that's one area, and it impacts not just DOJ, but other pockets of independence within the executive branch. Um, Immigration, we mentioned before, we had a really big story late last year about Trump's immigration plans, which are not dissimilar from what he announced he wanted to do in 2016, which was mass deportations. Um, uh, He also, you know, 
proposed a, a, a Muslim ban at the end of 2015, and he actually went for that when he got in office. And it was, it was, it was written, legally it was written poorly, um, and, and it went through a long court process, but it created an enormous amount of chaos um, in those first few days of him being in office. And I think that's important to remember. There are other things that I think that they can and will do to try to, um, to try to impact undocumented immigrants that don't have to involve raids. You know, they can involve benefits. They can involve um, just making sort of lives more difficult. Um, they've talked about using the Insurrection Act at the border. Um, Trump has openly said that, uh, and this one, you know, I think we, we, he hasn't said a ton on, but I think this is important. There is a question of Trump's relationship to the military. Um, he said in a speech in, in, again, everything comes back to March of 2023, but he said in a speech in March of 2023 at a rally, he talked vaguely about, um, about unrest in cities and was complaining that you have to wait for governors to sign off on deploying the National Guard. And he said, next time I'm not waiting. And, you know, I think there would be a lot along those lines. Um, and then there's the civil service changes that we mentioned before. He would reach for that again. The executive order was called Schedule F. He put it in place. President Biden undid it. But these are discretionary per president. It's very hard for uh, things that are not codified in Congress to be made lasting. So it's not like Joe Biden can make a lot of changes that would then prevent Donald Trump from doing things that he wants to do. The executive can do a bunch of things. Um, you know, and then I think a big open question for me is one of his closest allies, Cash Patel, um, talked openly about criminalizing uh, reporters and then tried to walk it back. Trump at a rally, I think it was last weekend, uh, might have been the weekend before, pointed to the back of the room at, to the press and said something about those criminals back there. Um, you know, this is, this is dangerous stuff. So we talk about him not really changing that much. It sounds like he has a learning curve. It sounds like he learns. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. No, you, I don't disagree with yeah, you. There's you a learning curve. I just more. don't think that makes him change. I think okay. he can still be the same person. But more effective, right? I, I think that he is, um, well, this goes back to the, your question about clown versus non-clown, right. right? I mean, right. I think that he is, he, is, he is not a deep reader. He is right. not, um, he's not a deep studier, but he is, uh, much more calculating than I think people understand. Will he be, be better than, I know this is conditional, but better at dealing with Congress? I mean, is it different whether we have a Democrat, Republican, Democrat? I, I think that's very hard to assess. I, I want, one thing that I would yeah. say, I mean, look, he, he, he never understood that Congress was an independent branch of government. Right. Um, and I would argue that... Or military, right? Right, right. or military. And I would argue that, I would argue that, um, that House Republicans increasingly in the Trump era have not acted like an independent branch of government. How, right. And I'm not talking about the Senate, I'm just talking about yeah. the House Republicans. Um, he had a terrible relationship with Paul Ryan because everything in terms of how Trump acts is based on how Trump is being treated. And that applies to world leaders, um, other you know heads of state anywhere, um, uh, leaders in, in other branches of government, um, governors, so forth and so on. And so Paul Ryan was very critical of him in the 2016 campaign, and he never liked Paul Ryan. And he tr saw Paul Ryan as part of the swamp. Same with Mitch McConnell. They just didn't mesh. And, and personal chemistry is a big thing for Trump. Um, so uh, in that way, he was not effective. Um, and he was self-defeating in the ways that we've discussed. There were other ways where he was actually very effective with Congress. He used the trappings of the office to woo House Republicans in a way that I think we don't still fully understand. Rides on Air Force One, mm -hmm. trips to Camp David, um, all of these little sort of touchstones, phone calls, things that are very easy for him to do, but that meant a lot to the members. It's actually something President Biden doesn't do a lot of, and the Democrats privately complain he doesn't do a lot of. But that's the old school, you know, backroom politicking that Trump learned in New York and is very good at. There's a, a great moment in the book you write about. He's wandering by the television set at Mar-a-Lago watching Flynn on Meet the Press right. and says, a lot of problems with this guy. Think he's going to make it? And you make this observation. Trump made managing the White House staff and systems nearly impossible. His people pleasing, his people pleasing resulted in him in agreeing to events and being put on his calendar and yelling at aides for loading up a schedule. And then lo loading at aides for yelling up a schedule. Again, is that a fair description of his management style? Is that what you would expect? 
Yes. It's kind of funny. And yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in, the, in, that, in that moment that you're describing about Flynn, um, that was when Flynn was uh, uh, under scrutiny for whether he had been talking to a Russian ambassador uh, during the transition. And, and Flynn had been the national security advisor for like, I think it was maybe like three weeks. But what struck me in that moment is that Trump is walking by a television set watching his own national security advisor, and he's like, hmm, think he makes it? As <laughs> if he's a, a bystander to this and has no like connection to whether or not Flynn might get dismissed from his role. Um, but so, and, and that is one way that he manages, is, is as if he's you know, sort of disconnected to things. He's very good at getting other people to go do something for him right. without openly telling them to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, he... he you know, he he agrees. Who one former White House official put this to me very well, and this was definitely true at the Trump Organization too. Whoever is in front of him in that moment is right. the person whose job it is to do that thing. He he doesn't have a respect for titles or division of labor or an interest in lanes. It's just get me, do for me, make this happen. And then the people pleasing that you mentioned comes into play, where you know he'll call aides and be like, "Don't listen to them. Don't don't listen to your superiors." come directly to me. Well, that's really helpful for the, right. you know, the mid-level people who are overseeing whoever he's talking to. And, and it, that's just not helpful in a government. You, um, you say in here that John Kelly uh, told people that Trump was a fascist, uninterested in history or geography, and uniquely unfit for the job of leading a constitutional democracy. Um, is that an outlier of you among people who sort of know him, do you think? Do, do you hear other people in his world? I mean, it's kind of alarmist. Um, or alarming, sorry. It might alarming. be alarming. Yeah, I mean, Kelly, alarming. Kelly, look, Kelly is a, is a, is a former lieutenant general. Kelly um, served the country for a very long time, lost a son um, right. in, in combat. Um, and Kelly is a student of history. And so when, when Kelly was saying that to people, um, I think it was coming from a place of genuine belief. Um, I think that Kelly thinks in stark historical terms about the U.S. government and what it means in a way that a lot of Trump appointees did not, because many of them did not come from government. Many of them were outside government. Um, but do I think that many of them would agree with aspects of what Kelly said? Yes. I don't think they would all make it public. Right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, there's a, a famous anecdote where Rex Tillerson um, then the Secretary of State called Trump a moron after a, a combative meeting. Uh, now, didn't call him to his face. Um, I, I don't, you know, there, there's a scene in the book where Gary Cohn, um, who's an economic advisor, is sitting across the desk from Trump, and they're, they're, there's others in the room, and they're trying, to, they're trying to talk about policy, and Trump starts going on one of his rambling riffs about something else that he had seen in the paper, this and that, and Cohn looks at others in the room and says, you see the shit I have to deal with here. And so, like, it's not, you know, I, I don't, um, I don't think Kelly is an outlier. I think the way in which he framed it might be an, more of an outlier. I think we have time for one more question, so I'll make it an easy one. <laughs> oh, that's nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> but not really. Um, how, <laughs> how exhausting is it to write about and report on Trump both in terms of dealing with him and dealing with our readers. And given that, what made you decide to do another book on Donald Trump, this one with Jonathan Swan? That was the and you have 21 easy. seconds. That was the go. <laughs> go. Um, look, this, is, this has not been an easy nine years, just um, personally or professionally, um, because this is, this is a story that is constant, and it's 24 hours a day, and, it's, uh, and the, the Trump White... I mean, sometimes I look back at... at how much we were, the volume of, of that period of time. It's actually a little slower now. Um, and, and I just want to caveat it that um, we're not doing what our colleagues in Ukraine are doing. We're not doing what our colleagues right. in the Mideast are doing. Um, you know, the work we do is, um, I think, very important, but um, I think we're doing it under circumstances that are um, definitely not as intense as that. Um, I decided to do another book with Jonathan Swan because A, I love working with Jonathan, and B, um, and he's, he's hands down the best reporter I've ever worked with, um, and because I think that we have similar uh, perspectives on this moment, and because I think what Confidence Man showed me is that there are, as, as much as I love what we do, there are things that simply don't work in the daily report, and um, that I had more to say, and I expect that will be true. Okay. 
Maggie, thank you for coming here today. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you.